copy this morning, Rob. In on the Rob's copies, so that means that everybody's probably grumpy and half asleep, unless you brought your own. Um, and everybody's kind of just not quite there, so. This is our Christmas service. Debbie made a request. She said she wants said she <laughs> feisty, fire, brimstone. I don't know what all that is, but that's what she said she wants, so. Yeah. I'm not sure how I changed I the message, but... You say you want to keep everybody wet that day. Well, I guess we're going to have to do some fire and brimstone. <laughs> Wasn't that message? But hey, maybe it'll end up being that way. <laughs> this is Christmas time, and this is our Christmas message. And I think that with all the things that go on in life, I think it's something easy to forget about the real meaning of Christmas. Anybody go shopping yet? Well, most of you probably done your shopping. I can't imagine going through malls. I just despise shopping. There's all these people in the way, and I want to shake their hands, and I want to talk to them all, but I know that in the mall, they don't like that as much. In a funeral, I can do it, and everybody says, oh, that's all right. But in a mall, they look at me a little creepy, so they just can't go to everybody and say hi. And my wife doesn't appreciate that anyway. She doesn't like to stay in that mall. So I know when it comes to mall stuff, I don't like it. Have you ever seen anybody wave to you while they're going by in the car, and they're only using one finger? You ever seen that? That makes the Christmas cheer come all the more. We're busy. We're running. We're going. We have events. We have family that we got to do. How many people's houses are spotless right now? Just as clean. You can eat off. Oh, Jesus. You can eat off the floor. It's not awesome. Most of the people, your houses aren't clean yet. And you're thinking, oh, my goodness. i got a whole bunch of people coming to visit. I've got to still clean my house. i still got to do cooking. i still got to do wrapping. There's a lot of stuff going on. At Christmas time. I have some gifts though, special gifts. And I'm not sure which one's which. I think that one is Donnie's. She's got a feeling. This one's for Donnie. I'm not sure why, but this one's for Donnie. I'm gonna get you to open it and see what you think. You gotta show everybody because that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to try it on? Did you want to try it on? I can. Yeah. It's, hey, it's, it's good for the bleeding ears, you know. Right. <laughs> Look at that. No, it also works, Donnie. That's a gift. That's a gift. I'm not sure what this one is. I I think this one's for Lloyd. I'm not sure what it is. I don't remember this one. I don't know that one. That was Lloyd's for some reason. Now, the better you know the person, the better the gift that you can pick up. 
If you don't know people, it's really hard to pick up a gift. It's not so easy. But if you spend time with them, you know what they like, what they don't like. You know what to get them. You're not going to get a bunch of flowers for Matt for Christmas. He's not going to like it. He's going to want something with video games or something. He's going to want something else. He's not going to want the flowers. Other people might. You know, we think about the people. We, we try to get the very best gift. You ever seen somebody open up one of your gifts and their eyes just light up? And they say, oh my goodness, I love that gift. And instead of after five minutes it's in the corner that's never going to be used again, they actually keep it with them. And a week later they still got it. Two weeks later they still got it. And you're saying, well, thank goodness I picked out a good gift. Well, yeah, 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 I still got it. We still got it. That's a special gift. One that just keeps giving to me. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. The, uh, but, you know, that's what we hope for. And you got to know a person in order to give the gift. And I want to show you something. Dennis is getting that going. I want to say that um, the parable of the sower. Anybody remember that parable of the Bible? Parable of the sower. Does that get anything new Christmas? Is that a Christmas parable? I think it is. I think it is a Christmas parable. You see, you can't see the picture, but we'll get it later. It has a picture here of Jesus, and he's got a mark in his hand up by his wrist, and he's throwing the seeds. And it says in Matthew 13, and chucks the seeds down, and it lands a bunch of, amongst the thorns. A whole bunch of thorns are in the life. And the seed gets choked out because we're too busy, we're too concerned with this world, and as a result, we lose the meaning of Christmas. The thorns represent everything that keeps us from God at Christmas time. And that can be a lot of things, such as family. Sometimes we just visit too many family, like too much of our family at Christmas, and we leave God out of the picture. Sometimes it's, it deal with friends. It can deal with money. It can deal with too many parties. It can be a multitude of reasons. But the Bible it says anything that keeps you from God is an idol, no matter who they are. Anyone, including your family and yourself. And these thorns have grown up into our lives. We've allowed them to grow into our lives. And when Jesus throws down the seeds, nothing grows because we're too concerned with this world. You see, at Christmas time, I think in Galatians 5, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. It's supposed to be love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are all the things that we're supposed to show at Christmas. But the fellow who waves with one finger doesn't show any of those. Or the gal. Not a bit. That's not what they're thinking. When you curse and swear at people, that doesn't show that. When they're angry, it doesn't show that. We have a hard time expressing our love for Christ at Christmas. i got to put my other... Yeah. I wonder what Jesus Christ thought when he was looking at a gift for us. He just wanted to leave us in at Christmas time. What was he thinking? I mean, we go through a lot of work. I know Rob probably does. To pick out a present for his wife, Judy. I hope he put, puts a lot of effort into it, thinking exactly what she wants. I'm sure he does. I'm sure Lloyd does too for Denise. He probably puts in some effort anyway to get the right gift. You want something that the person's going to enjoy in life. And you want something that they're actually going to use. Something that's useful, helpful. And I wonder what Jesus thought when he was thinking about us. He had a gift for us. And so it was the gift of the cross. What was he thinking before he gave the gift to us? What was he thinking in heaven? And there's several different things he could have been thinking about. And the first one is dust. Be the first thing you say. Dust. That's what we are. We are made from the dust of the earth. 
But it goes on in Psalms to say that we're made just a little bit lower than all the angels. Just slightly. And it goes on to say that we have honor, we have glory, even though we're a piece of dust. The psalmist cries out and says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Never assume that God doesn't love you, no matter what you've done. Because when he looked down from heaven, he saw God the Father's image in your eyes and said, I gladly die for them. Whether they love me or not, it's irrelevant. I'll still die for them. In scriptures it says, while we're his enemies, God died. Jesus died for us. He made the sacrifice. So I think he must have thought an awful lot about us. You realize we're the last living creature that was ever created? The last? It's amazing. On the sixth day, God created man and woman. There was nothing else created for living creatures after that. Not that we're told of, anyway. We're not told that. We're told that Jesus is off there. God is working in heaven, making a mansion for us. But we're not told that anyone else was created. Nothing. We were the last. And at the end of it, he says, this is good at that time. He thought it was pleasing in his sight that he made us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says, we are the masterpiece of God's grace. He thinks an awful lot of us at Christmas time. And I got thinking about how much he really does think. I think about, um, oh, we got some, we got some movement here. Oh, maybe we don't. <laughs> it's supposed to be. No. It's moving on mine. Hold on a second. Moving on yours, but not on this one. I'll keep going and we won't worry about the pictures. In Genesis, it talks about Enoch who walked and talked faithfully with God as if he was just in the Garden of Eden all the time. He had, he didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit. He didn't have the gift of scriptures. He didn't have any of that. But yet, he was able to walk with God closer than we are. Jesus would have saw that. He would have looked down and said, you know what? Enoch was an amazing person. What about Abraham? Abraham was told to take all your belongings and go. He wasn't told where he was supposed to. Just go. And Abraham instantly did it. He didn't argue with God. He didn't debate with God. He didn't say, well, if you show me the place where I'm going, I might think about it. He just went. I think of another person who was very faithful, and that was Moses. It says in Exodus 33 that Moses walked and talked with God like somebody, like a friend. He did on Mount Sinai when he got the commandments. He did inside the tabernacle. These are examples of people, and there's many more in the Old Testament, that were faithful, that were very righteous in God's sight. Jesus would have saw all the good in all of that. But he also saw other things. Psalms 36, 1 and 2 explains basically who we are more than anything else. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes they flatter themselves way too much to detect or hate the sin that they have in their hearts. First part of it, the wicked. It's actually describing us to a certain extent. In Peter it says we're babes in Christ when we first become new creations, when we become born again Christians. We're in the church still. Sometimes we think as soon as we get saved, that's it, everything's done, everything's good. But there's more work that must be done for us to become mature. And we've got to work at that. The second part though, when he says there's no fear of God at all in their eyes whatsoever, that is another part. Oh, look at that. Thank you, Dennis. We'll stay right there. Thank you, Dennis. The, uh, no fear of God in their eyes. Is that not us? Hebrews says that if God really does love you, he will discipline. Do you remember the last time you disciplined? By God? Would you even recognize him? Let's be honest. The answer is probably no. Most times if we get disciplined, we say, that's just bad life circumstances. And we dismiss it, just like we do miracles. We dismiss it, we don't see it. And we have no fear left of God. We're not scared of what he can do. A God that can take a mountain and throw it in the sea, and we're not scared. We don't worry about it. A God that can punish us in ways we can't even imagine, but we're not worried about that. We go our own path. The last part of the verse is the most important in Psalms. It says, in their own eyes they flatter themselves. They like to do a lot of sinning. And they don't even recognize it as sin. That's what it's saying. I've been in a lot of um, conflict situations where you sit down and you talk to two parties. And you ask them, you know what, there's, there's some grief here. There's some conflict here. And we need to go through it. And you always hit a stalemate when one party says, I never did it wrong. You got a stalemate. Automatically you got a stalemate. 
I have seen people, one party will say, I'm so sorry I did wrong. I really did wrong here. And will you forgive me? The other party will say, yes, I do. And then I'll climb up. Don't say a word. They won't jump up and say, I was wrong too, by the way. I want to confess that. I want to get that off my chest. Reconciliation requires both parties to be able to do that. But we have this problem. We don't see the sin in our own hearts because we refuse to. We don't recognize it. And as a result of that sin that's built up, that we never let go, at Christmas we can't see the gift God has for us. By the way, that gift sits in the middle of the church aisle, and it doesn't get open at Christmas. It's a cross in the box. Do we open it? Not really. Christmas tree looks beautiful. It's got lights on it. It looks kind of nice. It's kind of a little bit of a centerpiece. Where's the cross? It's still in the box. It makes me wonder, inside a church body, should we not open the box and look at the cross, especially at Christmas? Us as Christians? The answer is oftentimes, we don't open it. We don't want to. It goes on in scriptures and it says, the plight for us, for although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and the foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the moral God for a bunch of idols. What are your idols this morning? We all have them, realistically. We've all got idols. Whatever keeps you away from Jesus Christ at Christmas time, whatever keeps you from opening the box, whatever keeps you from fasting and prayer, whatever keeps you from acknowledging that He is your Lord, Savior, and King, that is your idol. And it can be anything. Family, friends, money, all sorts of things are our idols. And this verse is saying that when Jesus looked at me, He saw that. He saw we had a lot of idols, and we weren't willing to open the box. I want to talk about the life of Christ, and I want to talk about how important it was for, for him to come here and to make things right for us. He did know the recipients very well. It says in scriptures that the only one who knows you really truthfully is not yourself. It's not the people around you. It's the Holy Spirit. You cannot run. You cannot hide. If you're one of the people that says, i got no sin, 1 John 1, 8, 9, 10 says, if you think you've got no sin, you make God be a liar. Of course, you got sin. We all do. I have sin this morning, too. If you say you've got none, though, Jesus says, my spirit knows you fully and completely in every way. You cannot hide. At Christmas time, we need to get rid of the sin. We need to confess it. We need to be pure in front of God. But we've got to be willing to open the box. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But first... This is what Jesus did. Who being considered the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead he made himself nothing. He took the form of a servant so that he might be able to save us. He looked down from the heavens and he said, there is no possible way they'll ever be saved without my help. They're not going to make it to heaven. They're too focused on themselves. And he said, the only way it's ever going to happen is if I come, live amongst them, be their slave and their servant, and die for them. If not, nothing is going to ever change. They won't be able to get closer to me. <clears throat> you know, when Jesus was up in heaven, the angels glorified his name. You know, even the demons shudder at the name of Jesus Christ. It says on his earthly mission, it says Mark 1, 24, it says the demons, the legion of demons, they, they ask, Jesus, what are you doing here? What, what do you want with us? The appointed time has not come. What do you want with us? They shuddered in fear. Because they knew exactly what Jesus could do to the demons. How much more can he do to us? But we don't shudder. And we don't fear. The gift. Let's talk about it. Why don't we open it at Christmas time? Why does that gift have to stay in the middle of the church unopened at Christmas? I think the first thing is, is, is described in the virgin birth. It says that Mary, it says here, at birth of her firstborn son, she wrapped him in clothes, placed him in a manger, he was put in basically a bar. That's where he was born, in a bar. Now in Matthew, I find the genealogy of Matthew is very clear. It says right off the bat that Jesus Christ came from David. It also says Jesus Christ was the Messiah. It points out that Jesus Christ was a king. Now if a king came to Hillbrook, what would we do? I like to think we'd roll out the red carpet. I like to think there'd be cars miles upon miles. 
We would do everything that we could to make that king or queen or special person feel really welcome. That's what we would do. What did they do for Jesus? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. They put him in with the animals. And you know what? Adam. Adam got treated far better than Jesus did because Adam was put in charge of all the animals. Jesus wasn't put in charge of the animals when he arrived here. He was made to go live with the animals when he started out. That's how we treated him. Where were the Jewish people? Where'd they go? The star in the east shone above Bethlehem. The shepherds saw that star. They did arrive. The most lowest people in all of society were the only ones who showed up. Not the Jewish people. Not the Gentiles. No one else. Just these lowly shepherds. By the way, if you had a shepherd job, that was the worst job you could have. Absolutely worst. They would look at you inside the family unit and they'd say, look, John Doe, he's absolutely useless for, not good for nothing. Well, put him out and let him sheep. You keep an eye on the sheep. Surely you could do that much without getting in. <coughs> That's their opinion of a shepherd back then. We glorify shepherds now because we hear about it in scriptures. But back then, they were the lowest. The only ones who showed up was the lowest people in all society, the rejects, show up and say, there's my king. Where's everybody else? Where are the Jewish people? The wise men saw the star and showed up. They traveled for two years to come see Jesus. Not one Jewish person showed up. Not, not one Gentile person showed up. We knew the scriptures. We knew it was there. We knew that he was going to come in the way that he did. We knew the star would shine, but yet we did not show up. Why? I can tell you why the Jewish people didn't, and the Gentile. They weren't looking. They just weren't looking. The star was there, but they, didn't, they weren't looking. They got so busy in their lives. The thorns were so strong in their lives that they didn't look. They never looked up into the sky. They weren't thinking about Jesus at Christmas time. They were thinking about themselves. They were thinking about food. They were thinking about cooking. They were thinking about cleaning their house. They were thinking about the gifts that they would buy. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Except for when the one box that we should open stays in the middle of the church and doesn't get open. That's when it becomes an idol. And that's when it becomes wrong. The Jewish people missed out on their Messiah because they weren't looking. Well, we're no different. Same thing. We don't open the box. One of the res results of God offering us a beautiful gift is we don't open it. That's one of our responses. We just don't want to. We ignore it completely and fully. How would you feel if you gave a gift? I say Jamie gave a gift to Gladys. Okay, Gladys takes a look at, look at the gift and she says, oh, that's a really nice gift. Sure. And she throws it away. Or worse yet, Gladys goes and peeks in the box, opens it all up, looks in it and goes, puts a scowl on her face and shuts it real quick and goes, Never touches it again. How would Jamie do? Jamie spent the money on it. Jamie thought about it. She thought it was the right thing. Her feelings would be hurt. How do you think God felt when he gave his own son and died on the cross? And guess what? We really didn't care. And we still don't. Not fully. We don't want to open the box. It stays in the church, huh? A.W. Tozer talks about this. He says, why is it a whole bunch of people come to the communion table and yet they're starving at God's table? Starving for spiritual food. And yet they're here. The box should be open. That's only one response. The second response is far worse. It says in the scriptures, and the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God and cannot submit to God's laws, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. When Jesus Christ showed up, you would think the people would have been there. What did they do? His friends thought he was absolutely crazy. His friends and his family went and saw him one day. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to put him in a loony den for a while and say, look, you need to cool your jets and when you're thinking right, then we'll let you go free again. That was the response of his friends and his family. The disciples. Peter denies Jesus three times. The other disciples at the crucifixion disappeared. They weren't there. The only one that was there was John. The only one who was dead was Mary. That's it. Where were all the rest of the people? Jesus got nothing but hospitality as soon as he arrived. Nothing but conflict. Nothing but anger. And I think, unfortunately, we are similar. Right. That box, and it does have a cross in it, by the way, is incredibly offensive to be real. To all of us. Incredibly offensive. It angers us greatly. 
And we don't like opening it, especially at Christmas time. I'm going to write a book someday, I hope. Okay. I'd like to. I'd love to write a book. Here's the title of my book. And hopefully this doesn't offend you because this applies to me too as well. I, uh -oh, I'll be in trouble with that later. She ain't going to like that idea of you writing a book. Anyway, I want to write a book. And here's my title of the book. We are born again Pharisees. That is the best title I've ever thought of for us. We are that in spades. We are born again Christians. We know everything about God. We've had 2,000 years to study Him, and yet we will not open the box. 2,000 years of learning. There's nothing that we don't know that's in the box. And yet, we don't want to open it. Incredibly offensive it is. Because those thorns that are in your heart now, God demands them to be removed. The parable of the sower is... The box, the cross, is way too offensive for us. The parable of the sower is that our own things in our own lives, our desire to get our own way, our desire to always be right, our desire to make sure we get everything our way, our desire to go out and be with friends and family and all that stuff, which is really good. The only problem is that that is all we do at Christmas. And when we, God says, open my box, please, we look at him and say, not a chance. If I open that box, what will I receive? We already know. You're going to shine your light through my heart, and you're going to see all the sin. I've opened the box many times. Every time I open it, it doesn't matter how pure I think I am or holy I think I am, which I never do, but I open up the box, and it shows me all my sin, and I've got to confess them all. And I spend hours confessing my sin because there's so much that has to change. That's highly offensive for us at Christmas, to open that box. He says, I want you to be holy because I'm holy. I have given you the Spirit of God to help you to be holy. I still don't open the box. Now here's the box we do open. And this is the ironic part. We do actually open one box that God has given us. And it's called free will. We like that box. We open that every day of every year. We open up the box when we get up in the morning of free will. And we say, you know what? God lets me do anything that I want to do. He doesn't give me restrictions that are enforced. He gives me lots of rules and regulations. But those laws I can either follow or ignore. That's up to me. I make those choices. God lets me make them. So in the morning time, we get out and we open up the box called free will. And we say, I like that gift. That's a really nice gift. But the other box stays closed. Because that kind of tells us we've got to change. And that's something we don't want to do at Christmas. I want to just, in closing, just give you just a brief description of the gift. And I want to tell you how ironic it is that we don't open it in the first place. Isaiah says, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Have you ever felt lonely at Christmas? You ever miss loved ones? There's a lot of loved ones died at Christmas, by the way, in this church. A lot of them have. It's not an easy time for a lot of people. Have you ever felt like you made bad decisions in your life? Have you ever felt this year, that's not your best year, that you just didn't do the right things? You ever laid up at night and worry, wondering, am I the right person? <coughs> Am I the one that God wants to use? Is God really going to use me in whatever ministry He's given me? We've done all the spiritual gift tests. We know our ministry areas. Have you ever felt pain? Real pain? You know what? I bet you every single one of you could tell me a story that you have. There's not one person here who hasn't felt pain. Not one. And here's the absolute sad part. If you open the box, He'll heal your pain. But you have to open the box. That's the sad part of Christmas time. We have the hope of, as of salvation. We have the hope to change the world. We have everything that we need to offer them peace, love, joy, forbearance, all the gifts of the Spirit, and yet we still don't open the box. What we need most lays in. It gets missed out at Christmas time. It's not the way it should be. It says in Romans, therefore I urge you, Brothers and sisters in Christ, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Which means not only do you open the box, but you go back to where Mark says, 
Remember, Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You know what he really was saying? He was saying, self must die. Open the box and let yourself die so that Christ might live. That couldn't be any more offensive to this world that likes to glorify themselves. Our culture says it's all about me. It's got to be about me. It can't be about anybody else, just me. And when we say open that box and it's all about God, that's offensive. Incredibly offensive. And guess what? It's even more so for Christians. We get more offended about that box than anybody. We don't want to open it, especially at Christmas. It requires change. 1 Peter 4, 3 says, For you spent enough time doing what pagans have done, living in debauchery and sin, and, and, and having all of these idols. You've lived enough time in that, Peter says. Now open the box and serve God. Open the box and be healed. It says, therefore God exalted Jesus Christ to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. And Jesus, every knee someday will bow to Jesus at one point. Goes on to say that Jesus Christ is the Lord of everyone. You see, Jesus emptied himself for us. He didn't have to. He came here, he was persecuted. We treated him poor. We still do, by the way. If you ever think, and I know some people have thought, did the Jewish people actually crucify Jesus? Partially, yes. But you know what? Every sin that we ever do, we've crucified them ourselves. We have no problem at Christmas time taking a nail and ramming it in Jesus' feet. We're okay with that. Well, we're not okay with opening the box. Christmas must be more, much, much more than just presents, Christmas trees, ornaments. I'm not saying any of them are wrong. Absolutely not. You should give gifts to each other. It's a good thing. Not the gifts I gave today, but better gifts. Gifts that people might actually want to keep. And I want to say something about that. The gift you love the most is the gift that you open and keep. You open the gift called salvation, and you close the box. So did it not matter to you? That's the question. Did it not mean anything? I ask the same question of myself, because sometimes I leave box closed, and I shouldn't. My mother-in-law, she gave me a special gift. She had no idea how special it was. And if it's on tape, I suppose she'll find out. Anyway, I had a quilt. And I got it when I was a little boy. And it had a whole bunch of patchwork from my family. And it was all done real nice, and I kept that quilt. And of course, I kept it close to me. And after 20, 30 years, quilt it started to disintegrate. It pretty much wasn't much of a quilt anymore. And I thought, OK, got to throw it out. I just didn't have a choice. And, uh, Thank goodness for Ned's mom. She goes and takes the quilt. This is what she does with it. And I don't think, I don't know if she realized what she did to it. She goes and takes it and she restores it and she puts a bunch of patchwork from her family in it. I have no idea what stories are, but her cloth, her stories. And she restored the thing. And it looks better than it. I keep that quilt. I like that quilt. That's got a lot of history in it. Do we feel as passionate about God? Have we opened the gift this Christmas? Have we bowed our knee to Jesus this Christmas? Have we made time for him? i got to ask the question, I've asked myself, if you're not going to pray and fast, if you're not going to spend time with Jesus Christ this Christmas, if the family and the friends and the gifts and even the church body is more important than opening that gift, then we're not the right for him not being the Christians that Jesus Christ died for. We're being no better than the Jews or the Gentiles that executed. No different. Christmas is about far more. Do you know what Christmas is really about? It is about healing. That box is very demanding, but that box also has healing. It's at the foot of the cross that we get healed. It's at the foot of the cross we find out who we are. It's at the foot of the cross that we find out all of our sins can be forgiven. It's at the foot of the cross we learn who we are and how much God loves us. That's a gift. But opening it is absolutely fresh. You can tell how much you love something or someone based on how often you go back to the gift. You really can. 95% of your life is spent outside doing other things other than thinking about God. 95% of your allegiance is to the world and not to God. And that's scary. Especially in Christmas. So I give you a challenge. Get healed. 
from what's in the box. That's the challenge. Open the box. Get your healing. Open the box and tell God all your hurts, all your pains, all your sorrows. Truly, family's lost an awful lot of loved ones. So is other people. Open the box and get your healing. There are people that are wrestling with issues, terrible issues, family issues, the rest of issues with their children, with their spouses. For the love of Pete, open the box. Get your healing. There are people that aren't really sure where they should go in life. They're not sure where the next part of their career should be. They're not sure what God wants them to do. <coughs> open the box. And let them tell you. Don't be surprised if you ask you to change. But the miracle of it is when you change, you feel a lot of joy and peace at Christmas time. That's what Christmas is about. It's about Him healing us, even though we don't deserve it. It's Him healing us. Will you let Him heal you at Christmas? I certainly am going to more than let Him heal me at Christmas. I just love all the time going to the cross and getting healed. But will you do it? Will you do it? I love Christmas. I love presents. I love gifts. I love family. I love food. I love all of that. Please don't leave and think that I don't love that. I love all of that. I didn't get this big because I don't like food. And so I, I love all that. But I still think the box has to be open. That box must be. Get your healing at Christmas. We need it. We all need it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the great I am. And you are so amazing and awesome. We thank you, Lord, that even though we don't really like the gift a whole lot sometimes, and we don't open it a lot of times. We thank you, Lord, that you still offer it to us uh, without prejudice. And you till, still tell us, open the box, and I will heal you. Ask for forgiveness of your sins, and I will heal you. All your pains, all your anguish, all the people that you've lost, ask me, and I will heal you. But you have to open the box. You have to deny yourself. Take up my cross, follow me, and I will heal you. There's so many people here today, Lord, that need healed. So many. All of us do. I pray, Lord, give us the wisdom. Give us the courage. Give us the desire to open that box and just let your light shine. We need you. We all do. I pray, Lord. We should take the heal. We really should. It's not about us. It's all about you, Lord. And I know there's many here that have lost their way. And many times I do. I pray, Lord. And that's what keeps us steady and open. Open the box. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We don't deserve it, but you still have saved us. I thank you for that, Lord.